Hey, good afternoon, everybody. This is probably the moment many of you have been waiting all weekend for. This is the, the debut of Jason D'Ambrosio's moment in the spotlight where he gets to run his own panel. And I have given him the keys to the castle. He can do anything he wants for the next hour um, as long as Josh Casera permits it. So let me bring both these gentlemen in to get this thing started, and I'm going to get out of their way. So welcome to the show, both of you. Hey, guys. Hi, Bill. Hey, Bill. Hello. Uh, Jason, are you ready? Are you, are you sure you got it? I see you've been already, you know, putting text messages in the chat. So I know you know how to do that too. Until I overwhelm myself with trying to do too many things at once, I think we're going to be fine. But, you know, talking to Josh, I think it's going to be the easy part of this. All right. Well, fantastic. I think I saw Mikhail was in the chat. So he, he'll, he'll be your support mechanism if you run into any difficult problems. All right. Well, ha have at it, guys. Cheers. Hey, thanks, Bill. Hey, Josh. It, it, first of all, thank you so much for for spending some time with us today. Um, you know, Comic Art Live is. Uh, did they, you know, did they even tell you what Comic Art Live is or how it came about? I don't know how it came about. I mean, they did a bit. You know, when when come around, we started talking about OAX, and then I kind of got more off. Well, the very first, I think you had contacted me, and said, "Hey, I'm gonna." I didn't know anything about it. Like you had contacted me, and saying, "Hey, I'm gonna talk about one of your pages." I'm like that's cool. And that's when I tuned in. And since then, like I've been able to kind of like, you know, every Thursday or something kind of just listen in on things. So I've, I've gotten a little bit more, but I don't know how that all came about. Yeah. So, um, the comic art, well, comic art fans have been around forever, right? Yeah. But you, during the pandemic, comic bill started doing these YouTube shows when everybody was kind of stuck inside. Right. And the mm -hmm. hobby was, was, was tightening up and he started doing these YouTube shows and, you know, with conventions down, he created an online convention. And that's what we're having this weekend. That's why we're having a panel is Comic Art Live. And really, OAX is going to be our first live version of Comic Art Live. So yeah. it's coming full circle at this point. And I'm glad that, that you're able to be part of it. And, uh, you know, not only here, but but in January, you're going to be on the ground there. I mean, it's going to it should be a great time. Um, I wanted to, you know, you're um a modern artist. You're one of my favorite modern, my favorite modern artists. And the, and the guys in the chat know that I'm more of a, a, an old school guy, right? I'm a vintage art collector more. And, and the reason I, I, I am uh, interested in your art is you have a very old school feel up to it. So I don't know, maybe you want to start this talking a little bit about, you know, how you got into this. How'd you get into comics? You know, how did, how did this all come about? Come about? Um, well, I mean, me getting in comics was eight years old going to the liquor store not for liquor but for uh the spinner rack in the front and picking up i picked up grew number 57 actually no, it was 58 and that was my first comic i actually ever bought i think my brother he kind of is like oh you can get, he kind of got into comics and you can buy them at the spinner rack and and he buys just i don't know what he was buying at the time but that was grew was my first one so sergio aragonis that's like my first kind of real introduction to like uh, kind of modern comics right in a way and then you know and going into a few years after spin rack my brother found out there's a comic book shop and a comic, an actual store and that's all it is is comic books you know and especially at that time we're talking early 90s you know and so that's kind of where I just dove in right at the end right before the image era right it's the jim lee x-men and it's rob liefeld x-force and and so I was just primed for that. And that's meant for me 12 13 year old me you know it's pouches and pads and giant guns and um amazing lines by you know what i and then i well even then i actually bought at those comic shops you know even the comics were still relatively cheap they, there's the 10 cent bin right and yep. oh man i get some back issues of you know old x-men stuff or fantastic four stuff which i really liked and i really loved like the thing and that was kind of my spark i'd always like drawing like as a kid i draw like helicopters and army men and things like that but then when i found comics that's kind of like whoa this is like right for me and I was all about it and that's what I would draw all the time and you know copy my favorite artists and just had always drawn and like kind of thought oh I want to be a comic artist too but you don't realize like actual how much work goes into it and that sort of thing and I, I'd start learning like oh there's some actual learning a little bit of the storytelling and stuff and I would put some stuff together but never anything that was any good I never you know spent more than two hours on a drawing I'd get frustrated or just be like oh why doesn't my stuff look like theirs well you know, you only spend two hours and you have you don't have as much training behind you. So that's so just the training, Josh. Did you go to art school? Like, where, how did you build up this? No, I'm just I'm just self-taught. It's just from like just reading and looking at comics and practicing and other art, too. Uh, it's just I 
I mean, I, I had some, I had an art class in high school, but my, that teacher never, I actually would draw like a bunch of like spawn drawings and spawn pages and stuff. And uh, just on like printer paper like this, I do a sequential pages. I got to find those somewhere. Uh, oh my gosh. Well, uh, next time you ask me a long question, a semi-long question, I have to run. I know exactly where something. I found something yesterday I got from my mom. So hold on, I'll wait. But uh, I, I, I never went, I took like a, a community college art course. I never really learned anything. It was just all just self-taught. It's me just being at home, consuming everything, like just not just the actual books. There's some how-to books that, you know, how to draw comics the Marvel way is still just as relevant today. Like it's an incredible book. I've even had editors relatively recently even refer to it on certain things, you know, and I just, just, just wrote following, you know, my favorite artists, not just the way they draw, but now learning the storytelling part, right? Like we want to talk about like, just before I took on, well, now I'm drawing the X-Men. Like just when I jumped onto that, I, I reread Astonishing X-Men because the storytelling of John Cassidy. And that's kind of the way I wanted a little bit more cinematic uh, is kind of my feel. Frank Quietly is like one of my absolute favorite storytellers too. I mean, I like the way he draws as well, but it's the, it's the way he tells a story to me is what fascinates me and is what I always want to do is I want to make sure I'm telling the story as as clearly as possible and maybe in a, in a, in a much more dynamic way. And not, it's not about just in your face shots. It's about clearly like when I don't want any confusion at all. No, that's uh, honestly, that's probably what draws me to your, your style, right? I grew up on the same comics you did and, and yeah. you can see, you know, obviously your natural talent just comes through with what you're doing. Um, but one thing that, that always draws me to you versus some of your contemporaries is, you know, the backgrounds and the depth of the of the, the the interiors that you do versus, you know, some of the more modern artists. It's much simpler. Right. So I think it, it even though you're drawn in you know 2023 here, you're appealing to that, you know, 12, 13 year old in all of us that was reading the Jim Lee X-Men or, or, or the Liefeld X-Force or whatever was popular there. So that's actually incredible that you're self-taught. Um, the storytelling is so important that I think can be overlooked a lot in the medium, right? Um, especially as art collectors, we tend to be more nostalgic for those panel pages that tell the story versus some of the, the pinups and splashes and stuff like that. Um, so I'm going to, you know, I, I found you, weirdly, you were doing uh, a page in the Giant Size X-Men tribute book, right? And I was trying to get that book, and that's how you and I started talking originally. Uh, but you had a you had a history you before that, right? So where did you get your start in comics? So, I mean, kind of back to like self-taught. Anyway, so I did some of those some pages and things that I've done, but nothing. You know, I I I think I'd gone. I've been going to San Diego Comic Con since I was thirteen, right? I only missed a couple of years. I played football in high school and stuff like that. And I wasn't able to go during the summer, but then once high school and football was over, uh, I would always go. And then my brother moved to San Diego, was going living down there. I eventually moved down there to go to San Diego State. But I would go down there and I would just do the same thing, go through Artist Alley and consume it, just look at everybody's portfolios. And then I'd start kind of getting tips or asking, you know, just being that nosy kid that wanted to, to learn, you know, from the best and, you know, show my really bad samples around. But everybody, great, you know, great feedback and stuff, you know, I'd go back home. Then the next year, kind of work and show some stuff. But again, nothing was really going. I also wasn't putting in the right amount of work and really studying it correctly. But so years passed and I'd already gone through college again. I'm not, I, didn't go to college for art. Um, my now wife, we'd started dating and she'd seen some of my old comic stuff that I had drawn. And she knew like, I still would go to San Diego Comic Con every single year. And I'd still go to the comic book shop and stuff. Like it's still something I had always loved. And she's like, why didn't you do that? Like, you were pretty good at this. Like, I know this is something you love. Why, you know, you know, at the time I was just bartending and stuff. I had no real plan on what I was going to do. And I'm like 30 years old. And, and I'm like, you know that you're right. Maybe I should give it a shot. And so I sat down and started taking more time. I, I now at that point I had understood it took, you know, it's a full-time job. You gotta work 40, 60 hours a week doing this sort of thing. So I sat down and did like an eight hour drawing of Magnus robot fighter. I did like a layout drawing. I, I, I light boxed it and took my time and the world of difference. It was amazing. And it clicked like, Oh, okay. So I started taking more time and I realized if this is something I want to do, I know there's deadlines and there's no all kinds of stuff. So I, I made, I wrote out my own 30 page silent book and kind of thumbnail it out and i gave myself a two-month deadline to do a 30-page book while i was still working and i'd work from like till like four in the morning sleep four or five hours wake up early draw all day maybe take a nap a little bit before i go back to work at night and i hit my deadline and it's a little silent story about a, a, a japanese holdout in world war ii who's stuck in one of the islands just black and white 
And, you know, I look back on it now, the, you know, the drawings maybe aren't the best, but I hit my deadline. And the moment I was done, I was like, this is absolutely what I want to do for a living. Like, I, I love telling a story. It wasn't about just drawing a cool drawing anymore. It was about, I want to tell a story and I want to tell other people's stories, my own stories. And it was like, okay, so now I, I took it serious. It was like, okay, well, I, I hit my own deadline and I was like, yes, I, I will do this all day long. And started working up some like pretty good portfolio pieces and, and just started showing my stuff around. So at, at a San Diego Comic-Con one year, I, I missed, um, I missed uh, Titan UK had done a, like a portfolio review, but I had worked the, late, the night before, woke up, missed it. But I get to the show probably about noon and I just go by their booth. I said, you know, I missed your portfolio review, but if anybody, you know, can take a look at my portfolio, one of the editors is like leaving. He's like, oh, okay. You know, he's seen perturbed. And like, I'm off to lunch and he's probably seen a bunch of bad portfolios. And he, and I, I went into that show knowing that the, the portfolio was good enough to at least get maybe some work. Like I was comparing it to the art that's actually out there on the shelves. I'm like, you know what, this is maybe I'm not, I'm not Jim Lee, obviously. And you know, God will never be, but I'm, I'm getting better. And he took a look at my work. He's like, I got to run, but here's my contact info. And within, you know, a couple months, he kind of started finding some work for me. Uh, I did a, some like Doctor Who covers and he was trying to find a, one book for me. And then I did a creator own book called The Troop with Noel Clark. And by that time, like before that book had barely even come out or that some art was shown on Twitter, Tom Brevoort had seen it on Twitter. He was following Noel Clark and said, oh, uh, I need a fill-in artist, basically. He got my contact info and like over the holidays, you know, because this is kind of like a luck thing where a lot of this is luck as well. He needed a fill-in artist over the holidays because, you know, life slows down for everybody. And like, hey, I've got this new Avengers book. It needs to be drawn basically over Christmas, you know, from like December into January. You know, the regular artist is, you know, just so we can all catch up. And of course, I just, I'm going to jump right on this. And That's awesome. Yeah, it's, so that all worked out, and I, that first page I put all my effort into. I mean, the whole issue for sure, but I knew like that first page, I made sure you know one panel is really dynamic, three point perspective. I I just knew I had to nail that first page. If I can nail that first page, number one, they'll be really happy, and then I can not that I'll have a longer leash on the rest of them, but it's just that to show like the first impressions you know you want to make, and and then even through the whole issue, and they immediately were like, okay, and they're trying to feed me work after that. And I was like, oh man, I actually had committed to another book at Titan and I felt like, oh, Marvel, I like, had to run away from them now. And, but, you know, Revor and that they understand that you have your commitments. And I think they absolutely respect that instead of me breaking my commitment to Titan and a book and to bail. I think they like that. And I did a book, surprisingly enough, with Kareem Abdul-Jabbar, a, a Mycroft Holmes book. And okay. yeah, and that was like my second kind of well, third published book, I guess. And it was like a series, like it was kind of like a uh, swashbuckling Indiana Jones version of uh, Mycroft Holmes. Actually a great story, really fun. And I got to do that. Uh, and immediately I was like, in my mind as I'm doing it, I'm like, oh man, I kind of, you know, I'm, I'm, I don't know, maybe I blew it with Marvel. Uh, but kind of, I had given Tom my basic schedule and probably around that time when I was ready, he emailed me, I had something in the inbox and he was like ready to feed me more work. So I'd basically been with them since so you played hard to get you made them want it that's <laughs> and here you are right that's so exactly. i think I, I poked around on uh comic art fans to find some of your art because i figured people just didn't want to look at us the whole time they're already yeah. making fun of our beards in the comments I, I highlighted a couple of them already so just an fyi um i think uh falcon was one of your earliest uh regular yeah. series right? yeah i did New Avengers 7 is very, my very first issue. And then I came back, I did a 30-page Secret Empire, like, one-shot with, like, the champions. It had, like, uh, Scarlet, not Scarlet, which, uh, what's your name? <laughs> the Ninja, the Avenger Black, uh, Wid Black, Black Widow. Black uh, Widow. I did... Uh, I did a Black Widow, it's like Black Widow and Champions book, 30 page book. And then I also did some fill-ins during the Secret Empire event on the, on the main book, they would have like little vignettes. And I had covered kind of that section, the one, the, the group that I had covered in the 30 page book, they would, you know, Rod Reese and, and it was Lionel You was like the main artist and Steve McNiven. And then they would do like, we do five pages kind of in there. And then my first like series with Rodney Barnes was Falcon, yeah. So I, this, I, I went and found this because I told you one of the things that draws it draws me as a collector to you is, is your full pages, right? There's a lot of ink on a page. There's backgrounds. It, it's full. And this page really 
felt that energy. Um, you're all traditional, right? Do you want to talk about your process a little bit? Because I, I, you, you ink yourself, you pencil, you like pencils, inks. It's all you. So and that's just yeah. something we don't do too often anymore. In hobby. Yeah, no, it's all me on paper. I mean, there's, there's barely any uh, digital anything. And uh, maybe just levels and a little bit of cleaning up, and some of. But I actually don't clean my stuff up too much. It's actually when some of the inks and stuff I send, you know, it's sent in grayscale, and they, they want it like that, where you can see quite a bit of my pencil just underneath the underneath there as well and in some i'm sure some colors curse my name and stuff but i leave it and i kind of like that because sometimes a lot of the digital stuff even when it comes out in print it just looks too robotic to me and stuff it doesn't look like there's a real human hand behind it um but i'm, I'm just i'm this is kind of the way i've trained and i just haven't had time maybe to do some stuff digitally but i really like having it physically um in the page and you know smell of the ink and the feel of the pencil on the page and yeah i pencil right on the page i ink right over my own pencil sometimes for some of the covers for a while, I was doing um, like a rough and then light boxing on top. But now I just, just for time's sake, I just draw straight on the on the thing, unless it's kind of a very specific, you know, cool idea I did, a, you know, like a really maybe experimental idea. I might do a rough draft first, but pretty much everything's drawn straight on the page. You mentioned your grayscale, right? And you do put a lot of that toning into your original art. And here's a page from your Venom series that I pulled up to kind of exemplify that and just... Um, you know, does your editor sound, find it odd that you ink yourself? I mean, you know, because the normal process, right, is a penciler and inker, two, two separate people kind of get involved with it, and it's all coming from you. I think, well, nowadays, I think they hire now just I, I, that's so, you know, a separate pencil and inker. I think most new artists now that are getting hired, it's it's one it's a one package deal. Okay. A lot of it did with digitally their rough, draft, their rough drafts are the pencils and their finished pencils are basically inks right because digitally it's gone ink so you know i do the the gray tones speaking of that that, that 30 page book i did for myself i did a flashback scene in that and i added i did them in kind of a gray wash right to separate okay. it from the line work just to separate it and, you know we're in a flashback scene and i really liked it and i started drawing it. i think i'd seen francis Manipal at the time was doing kind of some gray washes too I really, really like that. Even though in the finished product on print, you can't really tell as much, you know. And so when I send these things in, a lot of times they do get blown out completely by the colors. You can't even tell what I do them, but I think they are good. If I want to have the right colors, they use it as a guide for how their textures are going to go, and they know how to work with it. If the wrong colors will make it look really muddy, and that's the problem. You know, sometimes I have with doing that, but very rarely actually do pages let go of my hands without some kind of tonal work as well. I always picture it as if this if my book ever gets printed in black and white and or maybe an artist edition or just like a full like hey x force number one or uh, 10 lives of wolverine number one black and white you know artist edition something like that it will read perfectly fine there i don't have any reliance really on the colors to fill in some backgrounds or textures or tones and stuff so i i just it's tough for me to let things go without that no it's incredible i've just been highlighting a couple pages here to kind of show that toning and as someone who owns pages from you your art in hand looks so finished it's just amazing um go into that color so i know you mess around a lot with color on your commissions now right and, and you've done some other things have you have you thought about colored covers to be published i know some artists are getting over to that kind of painting themselves or coloring themselves have you toyed with that that thought process yeah. well so the commission wise is it's kind of just a freeing thing. It gives people more options. Sometimes I see like some colored commissions. The the black and white, like the stuff you see here is really, you know, it's really tedious work for me. Um, I love it, but it, for the commissions and, and at conventions, it's I can't do that in person. Like there's just no way. I'm not, I'm used to just being by myself. Maybe my kid shouted at me in the background, but to talk and do this kind of work kind of in, in front of people is nearly impossible. The, the kind of colored sketches, they're much looser. They're more freeing for me. And it's kind of a nice break from my day-to-day -day work. So do using that, like I, I want them also to look, I do my, I do some, I do give people options on brown paper or the white paper and it's a multi-layered kind of thing. And I want people, I want it to look almost like a oil pastel or a chalky pastel. Like you can see right here, the first layer is like pencils and inks. And a lot of times on the brown paper, I'll use a red pencil and then I'll come in with some inks and then I'll come in with some markers or watercolor. And that's kind of my base cut. And a lot of times I'll work in complementary colors. So if I'm going to have their main color is going to be blue, I'm going to use some orange. Or if I'm going to use, you know, purples and yellows or greens and reds and, and things that will kind of bounce off each other. And then after some of that basic Copic marker or watercolor layer, then I'll come in with some colored pencil. 
And then it was kind of almost like chalky. I want them to look kind of rough. I don't want it to be like super smooth. And then come in even with some paint marker or even some line work with the um, colored pencils again. So there's just a lot more texture and a lot more depth and love than it almost looks like kind of like I said, a pastel or a painting as opposed to just kind of like a real clean um, color drawing. And it's just kind of more free and kind of artsy, if you will, I guess, if you, if you want to say it. And it's kind of fun for me to play with. No, I mean, I love it. I'm just showing one of your head sketches I pulled up of, uh, I think you did this one at New York Comic Con, actually, if I recall. Yeah, I think that was a, like, one of the pre-shows I did for New York, and I gave some people some options on those ones as well. But those are generally the ones you get at the show. Yeah, we'll talk. I want to talk a little bit about what we're going to do with OAX. But before we go there, I just want to stay a little bit on, you know, you, um, because you, you are pro prolific, right? You do a monthly book. You do multiple monthly books. You still manage to do variant covers here or there. Uh, how do you, you know, what, um, you know, how does, long does it take you? You know, how do you stay on top of that? How do you do what you do when so many other artists fall behind? With this kind well, of I mean, well, I mean, te I mean technically, I, I'm not monthly. I'm like, yes, I'm, I'm, I'm on X Men now. I'm on the, I'm the main X Men arts, but I'm not drawing twelve issues in a row. And it's, you know, it's about three issues and then a break, or four issues and a break. And it just depends on how much lead time I get. Uh, I'm doing the main covers. I do, you know, like I'm doing all the A covers, and I think I'm, a, I've just done eleven in a row for the main X Men book. I did just before that, and I had some love. So I was on X Force as a main artist on X Force from X Force number one. And I was doing, and then eventually Dustin Weaver was doing covers and then they said, you know, do you want to do the covers? And I did 28 in a row. And then I was, and then I, I was doing 10 lives of Wolverine and I was still doing those covers. And then they asked me to come on to X-Men and I started doing X-Men and then they said, oh, do you want to start doing the X-Men covers? And that, Absolutely. And I was still doing the X-Force covers and the X-Men of the main covers of that and some variants and some interiors. And then I think eventually they're just like, they took me off the X-Force covers, which I was kind of bummed about because I love doing those because I love that series and working with Ben and, and those characters and eventually took me off of that but it's because i just just not enough hours in the day but I, i'm not i it takes me about 15 hours a page i guess you know okay. i think on average i'd say you know from from start actual working time to start to finish some of them might be shorter some of them might be 20 hours you know i'm working on a, a cover right now that has 11 characters on it so it's definitely taking me a little bit more than uh than usual i guess because it's a cover so i'm being a little more careful and i've been reading uh somebody gave me a really cool john Byrne terry austin set of a a, a book some dark phoenix book that i'm reading right now so like my lines like feel really tight like i'm obsessed kind of with terry austin inks right now oh. so i of feel like my my inks got really tight on this cover and uh so you know you bounce around your influences from day to day so it might change you know i there's a a couple weeks where I was reading the Mark Silvestri Batman stuff and all of a sudden I was getting really sketchy and stuff and of course it looked awful compared to what he does and I had to bail on it because I'm like I can't hold a candle to him so yeah so a couple it, things you got a lot to digest there right number one I think I need to see that 11 character influenced by Austin cover so we'll get there yeah. but one of our, our our people in the chat mentioned this here uh, I'm the main X-Men artist. It's such a cool, cool statement to make. James Siegel said that. So I agree, right? Like thinking back on the history of the main X-Men artist, you know, you're talking Sylvestri, Byrne, we just talked about, Jim Lee, we talked about already, you know, John Romita Jr., Cockrum, going all the way back. It's like a big deal to to do that. Do you, uh, you know, they've all gone on to be kind of titans of the industry. Do you feel any pressure from that or how do you feel about that? It's weird. It's surreal. It's when um, CB Sobolski is the editor in chief, and I got a I got a text message from him, and it was like last summer or something, and and it's like, hey, do you have a few minutes to, for a phone call? And I'm like, number one, I have my regular day to day contact with my main editors all the time, assistant editors and and regular editors on the books and the offices, but the you know editor in chief, it's not like you talk to that much. So I get a message. I'm like, I'm either in big trouble or something really cool is going to happen if your editor if the editor in chief wants to talk to you so yeah he you know messaged me and gave me a phone call and and he's asking me he's talking about you know we loved your work on x-force you know we loved what you did on uh uh at 10 lives of wolverine i think i was in the middle of drawing that and when he you know because we line things up down the road and he's like you know hey pepe's leaving on uh he's kind of doing off something else so we, we were thinking that you would be the right fit for the x-men and so i was both like heck yeah but then immediately the same thing all those names just started 
piling up in my head and I'm like, oh, and speaking of just, I mean, just the, 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 the Pepe Larraz, right? I think Pepe yeah. is just astounding. He's an amazing artist, right? And and to, to follow him as well, not just, you know, as a, you know the, even the newest artists on the X-Men is, is such a thing, but yeah, Sylvester, Jim Lee, you know, Jim Lee, X-Men to me is, you know, my X-Men and see those guys in Cockrum, especially now, you know, when you talked about that, uh, that giant size X-Men um, throwback, I went back and just reread that whole issue because they gave us the PDF of the whole issue. So I'm just looking through it and looking at the art and just astounded and amazed. And yeah, I felt that pressure. So I all of a sudden was kind of really intimidated and upset. And my wife's like, no, you've got to take this. You know, I hated leaving X-Force, right? And Ben and I had built up a lot of story and which was great of working with him is he really included me in the storytelling and world building and some of my ideas I, I got to see on the page in the script all the time. So there was the scare of that now going to a new writer as well, not just going on to the X-Men, but Jerry's been great as well, incorporating my ideas, but extremely intimidating. But I'm like, you know what? They picked me for a reason. Just do your own thing. Just go and don't try to be anybody else. Just draw the way you want to draw it. And that's why, like I said, I went back to, but I did go back to uh, John Cassidy and like, how do I want to tell my X-Men story, you know, and then find some of those influences too. And the way I would want my run to look. No, you're doing a great job and it, it's, it's, you deserved to say the least. I mean, I'm actually highlighting one of your X-Force cover here and, you know, the, the work you've done on, on X-Force is, is incredible. You spoke of, you know, creating a universe over there. Um, one other piece that I have here, this was a commission I know you did for um, an, another collector of the, you know, the Tiki Bar. And the Tiki Bar, I think, is probably one of your most known pieces from X-Force, right? The actual spread in the book. Yeah. Um, so what did, how did that come about? You know, obviously it was a, uh, in the script, but, you know, I'm sure you had a ton of influence in, in putting that together. Well, actually, it wasn't in a script at all. It was my idea just to start. It was just like okay. Going back to Ben Percy, the writer of X Force Wolverine, right? He, amazing dude. We've actually become great friends. Uh, but it was, I had read some earlier, so, you know, I get all the advanced copies of stuff, and I'd seen what X Men number one, you know, the reset with Jonathan Hickman. And there's just a scene where they're on the moon and there's they're just in a cafeteria. The X Men have a cafeteria. So it's kind of like, you know, like a college campus, like a dorm, and they have a cafeteria. Or we're creating this whole island of Krakoa in this whole era. And, and I guess it's me being an old bartender, I'm like, they're going to have a bar, you know, they have a cafeteria They're where are they all going to hang out? We have all these now, all the old villains, everybody's all together. And so of course, like we all love the cantina scene in Moss Eisley and star Wars. And I love Jeff Darrow spread. So it's like, I wanted to do a giant spread of them. And I wanted to build this thing. They're on a, like a kind of tropical Island. So I said, naturally Tiki theme kind of bar. And I wanted to put as many as I could, you know, I gave the, the editors a checklist of who I can do. Anyway, oh, actually, I just pitched it to Ben first. And I said, I want to just draw a big scene of the all the characters we can. Like, nobody's done that yet. We're getting, we're getting to create this whole, you know, get to do the world building. I threw it out to him, poured my heart out on it. He's like, okay, you know, I'll come back to you. And two weeks later, he's like, we're going to do it. And I'm like, what? He's like, we're going to do the bar scene. And he's like, and he created, he crafted, he pitched it to the editors and created, put it in the, you know, a brilliant writer can do that. And he came with my idea and was able to work in a story to get us, it was kind of a good breaking point between this giant mission we had before and boom, here's the scene, everybody at the bar letting loose and a bunch of little vignettes within it. And then we jump off from there. So, you know, I pitched it to him. He created a story to get us there, pitched it to the editors. Luckily they'd let us get away with doing a bar. I even created a whole drink list and designed <laughs> mugs, everything. They didn't let me, we, they didn't let us publish that part, but they let us get away with the big bar scene. So that's, Every, every convention people come up to me and it's that's the one that everyone always points out they're like oh you're the one who did this scene and it's one of my favorite things i've ever seen and you know it's kind of i'm happy with that if people you know remember me for that josh let me tell you we are going to have some signature drinks at oax so maybe we need to get that drink list you created over to kazra and see if we can make one of those drinks come to life in real life well, the only problem with that, they're very heavy tiki drinks. And I don't think we want everybody to pass out on the floor in the first 20 minutes of the show. So. <laughs> That's fair. That's fair. We could definitely bring it up, bring it over, though. One of our uh, regulars here, Mikhail, just said best commission ever on this, just to give uh, you uh, what the they, feeling yeah. is. Well, that's the thing with this commission. So, you know, the person came out and said, I love this scene and I love Rogan Gambit. And in the giant spread of 70 characters, you can zoom in, there's Rogan Gambit at the bar. He's like, I want to do that. But now, like, you know, let's get in a little more eye level. And I want Dupe as a bartender. And, you know, and he gave me a list of, 
I said, just give me a list of the possible characters you want around. Cause I said, you know, how many women do you want to squeeze in? You know, cause that jumps the price too. If you want to do 30 characters, we're going to do it. And he's like, maybe seven, six, seven. Okay. And I said, just give me a list of like your top 10. And then I can, I'll work in and find a way to like incorporate them and see how it works story-wise, you know, cause I want it to tell a little bit of a story as well. And uh, I mean, it, I think it came out really well. And I get, and, and like every commission, I get there if I do use it as a print. I get whoever did commission it the permission to use it as a print because I kind of treat it as you commissioned me. This is your private sale. I don't necessarily, you know, I've made my money from the commission, but if I'm going to do it as a print now, I will ask their the commissioner's permission first. And if they don't, I don't mind. That's fine. It's their thing and their private commission. If they don't want it to be all public, that's fine. Not like anybody's nobody's turned me down on that yet, but I, I like to leave that as an option. Uh, the funny thing with that in the background in Krakoan is the uh, guy who commissioned it, his name is actually on the sign. And he thought I was going to erase that for the commission and put something else. I'm like, no, you're, it's kind of like your signature since you're the one who got the commission. I'm going to let so people who buy the print from now on, they still have your name still on it. That's after, that's awesome. That is uh, fantastic. Yeah. While we're talking about commission, I guess we'll, we'll talk a little bit about OAX, right? You're coming to OAX. You're going to get to deal with all of us, us, you know, fans in, in in real life. I know you opened a commission list for before, right? To take, I think there's one spot still left open, right? Yeah. Of the five last time. Yeah. And speaking of the commissions, I mean, there's that one. I like Marvel, my schedule is so full. And I also like try to take care of my health and I love my family. Like I actually try to have some family life too. So I actually rarely take on commissions. Like people, I, yeah, I, feel, I, really, I feel really, really bad because people message me all the time and I have to just push them off. And I'm like, when it opens, I back to just kind of my, my ethos as far as commission wise, I don't like to take on commissions unless I'm able to draw it within the next two weeks, right? I won't take anybody's money or anything like that because I don't like people like you, you know, if it, to part with their money and then they don't see a commission for two years. I don't want to do that to anybody. I've heard some horror stuff. about that. And I, I, I really don't. And I just, I'm just so busy and I don't want to do that to anybody. So anyway, like you saw that commission last year, like full size 11 by 17 commissions. I might've done three at most. No, not even three or four. I probably did maybe three last year. That's it. Um, and otherwise it's just like the, those convention sketches, the color the busts and the half bodies. They're a little more relaxed, but as close to my published work, like that one that you saw, I was offering for OAX. I had uh, five spots. I think you said there's one spot left for them. They're full. They're, they're going to be full body, um, no to minimal background, and maybe if you know it, it behooves the the, the sh to show the powers of the character or something like that. Maybe I'll have some incorporate some background, but generally just kind of the just the black and white with some tonal work, um, full size on eleven by seventeen, and you know maybe so there, there, there's one spot left for that. So anybody yeah. who's listening, if you want that spot, email Bill. Um, at comicartfans.com and we can get you that last spot. Like Josh said, he doesn't take commissions often. So this is an opportunity for you to get one. You, you saw the work. I just brought up the example here uh, of a Venom that he had done. Um, his pricing is beyond fair for what, what goes into it. And from what I know of Josh, it's going to be more than just a, a character standing there in, in, in most cases. I, I know he usually yeah, adds really a really I mean, I, the, the first four ones that came in, like, um, like great picks by the guys, everybody who uh, wanted to get them. Like, they, I think they picked the right kind of characters and that'll fit with the style that I want to go for. So I'm, I'm really excited about that. And, and you know, I'll, I, I'll offer some sketches, but it's, you know, it's a pretty short show. You know, it's only just two days. So I don't you know how many sketches I am going to get um, to, you know, to do at the show. And I love to talk with all of you. I want to get to know all of you guys as well. And, but I'm going to bring piles of art. I actually just told my wife, let's order like two more portfolios because I'm going to, I, there's a, I just have piles of art that I have not really technically put up for sale publicly. Like, you know, somebody messaged me interested in a page, like I can look and see if I have it, but I haven't just been like, here's all this stuff I have for sale. I've got piles of X-Force art, tons of even some of the recent X-Men pages and things that I haven't really put up for sale. And speaking of that, like there's some covers and stuff that I've done that are incoming uh, or that I just been shown by Marvel that I'm holding off. And I've already had people inquire about them, but I said, I'm holding off for OAX to that. That's the first place that I will make them available is have, have my table at the show. So you've shared those to me. I'm going to share them with everybody now, if that's okay. Those three, that's I know we have at least three covers that are going to be OAX exclusives. They're not, you can bother Josh right now. You're not going to be able to buy them, but you will be able to buy them at the show. The first one, and uh, this is funny, 
because uh, a friend of mine actually knows that I, I talked to you, Josh. So when this cover was shown publicly, he messaged me. Yeah. Um, the Daredevil cover you did. And he's like, do you know if Josh is selling this? I go, and I couldn't say anything at that point. So I'm like, oh, I know a little bit about this. I'm like, you probably just need to reach out to him. Um, so Khalil, this is going to be an OAX uh, uh, exclusive if you're in. Um, so come, I think you're coming. So, you know, it'll be available there. Um, just amazing work. Uh, is this your first Daredevil cover? I don't really recall you yeah, doing it's much my there. First official. I think I... I think I got to draw Daredevil like in the background or it's just kind of one character off. I think that's my first official Daredevil drawing and definitely my cover. I was really happy because it's it's one of those characters like, hey, I would love to at least get a crack at Daredevil. And my my idea was, you know, I had the classic, this, this the, the kind of the circles around him, the concentric circles and stuff. But I we talked about a little bit the old school stuff. Like back in the day, a lot of sometimes on the covers had some panel work on them. And I, I kind of want to bring that back. And so... You know, I'm really happy that Marvel and my editor approved when I pitched. I said, I want to have some actual panel work on the cover. And so his panel tells a little bit of a story, him fighting these. I wanted, a nin I think, ninjas originally, but they said to, to story-wise, to match with what's going on in the materials, it's these kind of like uh, kind of like SWAT group and stuff like that. So I'm okay. So I just incorporated, do the little story, but then did the, you know, the lines of his senses. And, and, uh, and I, I know the original art here, but I was really happy with the colors, the way it came out too. And I, I couldn't be happier. And I was... I, it's one of those where it's tough that I might not let go because it's uh, Daredevil, but I thought, you know, for OAX, I think it would be a good reason. I think it would be a good way to, uh, to, to do the show and bring that guy. No, I agree. You put it all into this, and uh, this is an exciting one. The second one that we are going to – oh, I'm clicking the wrong buttons here. I'm new to this, guys. This one I might have to have a conversation with you about at uh, OAX. This, I guess, is the Predator Wolverine series. Right? You did a this was a variant cover because I know you yeah. didn't do this whole. I, I actually don't think this is out publicly yet. The colors have been oh. in for a long time. It's okay. Don't worry about it. <laughs> I don't think I'm gonna get. I don't think they're gonna cancel it or can it for that reason. It's it's uh it's for the one of the issues of that. I maybe number five or something like that for Predator Wolverine and uh which benjamin percy is writing and stuff so they i'm in contact with those editors and they say hey if you can squeeze it in i'm like absolutely i would love to do that and i you know i pitched the idea of the trophy wall like umberto ramos did the best you know classic spider-man or the craven trophy wall thing and so that was kind of a little my take on his and i don't want to you know really bite it too hard but like you just can't help doing the trophy room to me when i think of predator and of course like all the different eras of wolverine on some of the covers they have different eras of Wolverine. You know, I've seen McNiven's done a lot, you know, done a lot of main covers and stuff, and they would do different eras of Wolverine versus Predator. So I said, well, why don't I just stick a different bunch of different Wolverine heads on a wall, you know, and two claws and a couple, you know, even an adamantium skull and just have, you know, Predator just from the back, you know, backlit or uplit. And I was really pumped up to do that one. So that, that's another one that I'm going to say that actually, again, it hasn't really been public. I think you guys are all going to see, or you're all seeing it here for the first time. That I'm going to be I appreciate it. I mean, guys, this is a reason to to tune in to, to Cap Live more than anything else. And then you sent me one other cover, and I think this is an X-Men cover, if I'm not mistaken. Yep. Uh, Nimrod is a, a classic X-Men villain, and this is just amazing. Um, you know, is this one out already, or is this coming? Just, that one just went out probably, probably like a two, because I think that's issue 30-ish. I'm not sure. Uh, that comes out probably like January, February, but that just went public. And again, kind of back to the old school thing. I wanted to do some sound effects on the, on the cover. You don't really see that anymore at all. And I did the, you know, I, I was like, they were like, Oh, you can put Nightcrawler. I'm like, perfect. All I pictured my original pitch to them was just Nimrod trying to get him and just uh, the whole series of bamps and clouds everywhere. And he kind of swoops, you know, around, but they said, no, we got to have more of the characters in the story in there. So then I crew, I'm like, okay, well, he's going to be crushing, Kitty's skull, and he's just about to snap their skulls, and then, you know, just as, yeah, just as Nightcrawler's bamping around, but I, I really love that they let me do the, uh, the sound effects on the cover, so that's, like, I, I love doing that, you know, I, like, I try to do it as much as I can on the interiors as well, because then looks better than an original page with the sound effects on it as well, and so I, they let me do it with the cover, so I decided, you know, I'll, I'll save this one for OAX, and I have in probably two more x-men covers that will be public by that time and i think i'll hold on those to those to, for oax as well i can't really talk about those ones but they i think will be for some collectors especially for some certain characters would be very interesting yeah man i'm a sucker for words for for sound effects on, on art and on a cover especially is is just a home run so this one is a, a beautiful piece 
Um, now you are, you know, you have that one spot left that we are uh, that we have available on the eleven seventeen. Let's talk a little bit about what you're going to be doing. At, oh, before I get this, because you didn't even offer these, I can tell you in the art community, yeah. you do these tiny characters, right? I've seen you have them at some shows here or there, right? Like oh, the small, something like that. Yeah, the mini. Uh, mini those are very popular. So if you have you, you want to doodle some of them out before OAX, I know that there's our collectors that were clamoring to get some of those. So oh, that's you know maybe I, I, it's one of those where I've done one on a flight. Just I think I'm doing like a Portland show, and just on a flight, I did like a miniature Venom, and you know he's like a big body character, and I just did him small on a you know nine by twelve white paper and a Bristol board, and it just it came out great. That's the having the bigger paper with the small character because the bigger the paper, the better. Like they look even smaller. And then I did a Hulk and then I did a thing. And then just like, I, they, people just bought them right up. And it's so funny. Cause like, I don't know why I, I, I should do a whole set and I will offer it as an option. I do offer it as an option at, you know, for co conventions and stuff. And I, I charge like 125 or something like that. Not, you know, nothing outrageous, but they, they come full color and they're just a little miniature version of the character that you want. I, I know they're popular. That's why I figured I'd mention it um, while we're getting into this. I know you're going to do, I know you're going to do some remarks. So here's just an example of what your, your color remark looks like. And these are, you know, 50 to a hundred dollars. I'm sure you could kind of pump those out. Um, you know, amazing way to just get some, get a little piece, a little piece. Um, then you're going to do some, some head, head, head bust mm -hmm. black and white. Those are going to be $300. If you can get on the list for that. You do them in color too for a little bit more. I love these brown papers. I have a few of your brown paper pieces. I think they just come out uh, exquisite. I would highly recommend if somebody can get on your list for this. Um, and then probably my, really, I think the best bang for your buck commission wise from you is, you know, your, your, your half body sketches for uh, $600, I believe. And you can do these on white or brown paper. And you're going to, these are all going to be first come ser first serve. Yeah. At an OAX. So, you know, when that show opens, if you want to get involved, this is the place to be is to getting on Josh's list. And I actually haven't put mine away yet. So that's my 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 half body Phoenix that Josh did for me. Yeah. Um, so, you well, know. you kept you kept requesting. I think did I draw that on a live or something like that? And you just on a live. every every time I was drawn, like I would, I would post like, hey, who do you want me to draw? And what did I see? Anytime I saw the Phoenix. Of course, your name is going to be attached. So, and I eventually caved. I think after many, many times, and and eventually, like I think, in my, I just even had just started drawing it. And you're just like save that for me. So, yeah, hundred percent. I mean, uh, it's my character. I get as a commission, and I it was just like a running joke. I whenever I would see you post it, I'd be like Phoenix, 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 and you finally broke down. And she's here, and she will go on the wall once I get her frame. Um, you know, just. Uh, Really happy that you're coming. Are there any creators that you want to meet that you haven't met that are going to be at OAX? Have you looked at the list yet? Yeah, well, you know, actually, I was going to ask Bill or Kajra. I would like to see, like, a, a full updated list on everybody um, and see who all is coming. I'm sure there's a million names that I do know, but I, I guess I want to meet Adam Kubert in person because I – we've had some pretty good back and forth online and now I, you know, I've drawn a lot of Wolverine and he was doing the covers for 10 lives of Wolverine while I was doing the interiors. Yep. So, and he's been nothing but like super complimentary to me. Like uh, when I do post stuff online, which is really surreal and weird when, you know, one of your, you know, heroes and inspirations for the stuff you do now, like likes your stuff and, and comments on it. And, and I'd really like to meet him in person and just be like, thank you so much. I'd love to meet you. And, you know, uh, you know, of course, Sean Murphy, you know, he's just amazing. And uh, I, I have an old, like, American uh, punk, like a punk rock Jesus uh, from uh, from him, too, that, I mean, yeah, it's already signed. I just want to say, like, you know, I've loved his work forever. And, again, like, I want to look at the rest of the list. I know there's a, a many names that I want to go see. That's that's going to be the hard part about OAX. Like, I do want to meet all you guys and sit at my table and stuff, but I want to go look at everybody else's art as well and go in, introduce myself and meet them. But, my, you know, my wife will be with me. I'm going to have – piles of art um you know i'm not really it's not i'm not there to really sell prints i might i'm thinking about maybe doing like just one exclusive print and that's the only thing that i would bring as far as like a print wise but i don't know about that maybe just maybe just uh, just all art and no, I, I, go ahead sorry Jake, but like yeah the first come first it is for those like you know the the you can message bill for the those the pre-show there's the one slot left 
but nothing else I'm going to take a list for. But after that, it's going to be first come, first serve on that first Saturday morning. And, um, you know, it's a, it's a pretty short show, so I don't know. I, it'll probably fill up really fast because I don't, you know, have much time to do it because I'm not going to be like, well, you're going to be here on, you know, four days later or something. It's, it's got to be ready by tomorrow because I don't want to do – I also don't want to take on commissions and say, hey, I'm, I'll just mail it home to you. I, it's I, You come to the show for a reason to come get some art. I like to – try to have i think i've only ever had to once or twice ever had to mail something after a show and i really don't want to do that to to somebody i know and everyone's so nice and understandable um understanding but i try to get it all done before the end of the show we want you to socialize too we don't want you to be locked in your room drawing so you know but uh, i think you're gonna do we got a question from the audience here and uh is duke considered a full or a half body <laughs> Oh, he's a full body if, if you see his butt or something, right? I guess you see <laughs> it's a full body. Very. I thought that was a good one. So uh, they're still announcing artists. So they, I'm sure Cosra can share the whole list, but it, it should be pretty exciting. Um, so I know your wife is a budding art collector, right? She's starting to, to buy some other people's art too. Yeah, Are you worried true. about having her there with all these other that artists? Is, that, is, that is the main problem for – I'm worried about any any amount of money that I do make at the show that I'd like to pay for like house bills, maybe, you know, anything like mortgage or important things that she's just going to go off and go crazy. So, no, I, it's it's fun because she's, you know, I just started doing conventions like a year ago. And, and actually, it's so funny because next year, I'm not going to do that many. Speaking of which, for people who are coming to OEX, I won't, I will only be doing maybe like WonderCon, San Diego, maybe New York, and maybe like Dallas, like not that many conventions next year. I, I want to just go back to doing my regular work here too. It's just, it, it's, it, it gets a lot <laughs> to travel and do all that and interrupts my regular work schedule. But uh, yeah, she, she started to, you know, have an eye out for what she really is. You know, I have my interests and she like her stuff that catches her eye and she's starting to learn a lot more through me. And so she's out there and she's, she likes a lot of the old school stuff too. I mean, there's some modern artists she loves and, you know, she obsesses about, um, I think even behind me, there's, this is kind of, this is a Jay Lee actually right here. Um, and she loves him cause she likes gothy kind of stuff, but she also loves Steve McNiven too. She's like, she thinks he's incredible, but then she likes old. So she's, she's, I don't know what I'm gonna have to do, sell a kidney or something, but she's looking for some old tomb of Dracula pages. So yeah. we'll see if we can find you one, Josh. A lot of the collectors are going to have folios there of older yeah. stuff. So I'll keep my eye out and we'll get, we'll get her a good deal. I promise. We'll find something nice for you. Um, speaking of uh, this one, I loaded up and we haven't shown it, but this is kind of unique because I have a couple pages from this. This one is not mine, but this was from the, a short for Wolverine black, white and blood. Right. So it was a 10 pager or something like that. Yep. And you actually went in and painted these up for the, for the collectors, right? Is that, this is your colors on here. Yeah. What happened was just this. So I think I was in between scripts or I forget what it was that they said, hey, can you come in and do this 10 page uh, story with Matthew Rosenberg for the black? And I'm like, heck yeah, I want to do a Wolverine story in black and white. And because I do the gray tones, I think that's why they wanted me to, to do one of those stories. And it was just gonna be in blood. So I was like, okay, I'm gonna do it. And I was gonna hand watercolor all the things, but just schedule wise, I just didn't have the time. And I had to jump, I had another script. I was already doing Talents of Wolverine or something like that. And I just couldn't do it. And so unfortunately they were digitally colored for print um but when i came around to now i you know for to selling the pages i offered to like to hand color them in the way the way i originally wanted them to be for for print and so that was kind of the option i gave people if they wanted me to hand water color them and then i was more than happy because that's the way i would always picture the the pages as well so that's when i when i did sell them just like this with the big speaking of the uh doing the sound effects uh, the big red snick there, um, but the whole drawing the eye, his that little book in in the top panel there is red, and then you see it there. That's kind of like that's the focus, you know. And then the next page is like I wanted to do focus here. I did a red door and things, and that was to draw your eye and to tell the story. And so I really wanted to use the red, and that's why when I did sell those pages, I wanted to look as close as I had envisioned them. Uh, one hangs on my wall behind me. It's directly behind me, so you can't see it, but it is. Uh... Do you do you have the wait? Do you you own the super gory one, the super slashy one? Yeah. I own the yeah, I own the in costume super slashy one, and I own the splash where he's all shot up with the fireplace and like all the dead Hydra agents around them. 
Uh, so I, that's a, you had offered me the whole book and the whole story. I wish I, in retrospect, I wish I took the whole thing. But yeah, I kept very, all of them. I think all of them are gone except I think I kept one. I think all of them are gone. So and so you you have a couple and I kept one of them, which weirdly enough is like only the is the well not really I, I kept I kept the, the splash page of Nick Fury and him and he's shooting somebody in the back and and Wolverine slashing a bunch of dudes and stuff like that. I'm like I couldn't let that one go. It's got to stay. That's a great one. That's a great one. Uh, fantastic story. So we have a, a, a pro level here uh, uh, suggestion for you. Ask for a trade, Josh. So find somebody with that t- Tomb of Dracula page and, and trade them something from your folio. This way you don't have to spend your your, your mortgage money. Great. Well, actually, that's but now I'm not going to have anything on my table because now my wife's going to walk around with these four portfolios of the show and be like, here, here's two of them. Here, no, here's all of them. So. Uh, so. Um, so this is exciting. Are you guys going to do Disney and stuff while you're down there? I mean, it's so close. No, well, originally we were going to stay for like a full week. Uh, but now we're just going to be coming for OAX and I think I got to head back home. I, my daughter has school and, uh, I, my, my schedule is just slammed all the way through like spring, I guess, as far as my official Marvel schedule as well. So no, I would have liked to, uh, we did. A little bit of that last year. I just when we did the the other show, the um, the one that was in April there in Orlando. Uh, but no, I'm just going to come in for the weekend and party with y'all. Awesome. So your last spot is sold out. You're now sold out of pre awesome. pre commissions. Awesome. We just Thank got a note from Bill in the in the chat there. Um, so what's in the future for you? Are you staying on X Men? Is there something else coming up? Big project? What do you got? No, I mean for now, I'm I'm on the X Men. I mean, there's this whole. Colin era in the fall of X and I'm, I'm still on the main X-Men book um, all the way through. They've kind of, I've seen where my schedule and, and there's kind of how they're going to wrap that up. And we're kind of figuring that out now and I'm figuring out, you know, my pace of drawing. Hence, like, I can't just take another week off after OAX. I got to get right back to doing that. But for now I'm in Mutantville and they're kind of, we're in kind of talks and figuring out where I do land afterwards because there is going to be a changeover in the X office. So I love drawing the mutants and, you know, again, I grew up with them and I love being there, but you know, I don't know what, what the future is for me. Obviously there's plenty of uh, books and characters that I haven't touched yet that I would like to at least put my stamp on, you know, and grow as an artist. So, uh, you know, if whatever they let me mess with in their sandbox, so Marvel, we're staying at Marvel, though, right? Well, I don't got to worry about you going to DC or anything like that. I'm not a DC collector, that's why I say. Uh, <laughs> well, I'm, I mean, I'm exclusive with Marvel for now, so you know they they are uh, I'm betrothed to them, and so. But if you do need to see, if anybody does want me to draw Batman, it would have to be in a private commission right now. There you heard you heard it, guys. Let's get some Batman head sketches done at at, uh, at OAX for Josh. <laughs> All right, we are getting close to time here. I don't know if Bill's popping back in. Um, glad to see you sold out. Glad that you spent some time with us. You are on the, the West Coast, so it is early, middle of your Sunday. I, I really yeah. appreciate you coming on and doing this. Um, yeah, no problem. I do have to show you. Wait one second, okay? Oh, I forgot. you got to get something. I get distracted, guys. I apologize. So as... We talked about me as a kid when I was younger. So I saw my my mom yesterday. I was at a family event yesterday, and my wife had asked her, said, "You know, you have some old pictures and some old artwork from Josh." And, and she found this, and I'm, and I did this. I think probably when I was. Oh wow! Wizard cover. Yeah, like I. This is my first and only wizard cover, unofficially. I guess it would be because this is me, 12 years old, wanting to draw a wizard, and this is my only cover recreation I think I've ever done in my life. So wow. I'm probably 12 years old. Unfortunately, some water damage or what's going on here. But yeah, I even wrote like Mark Bagley interview right up top here. And, um, I, obviously, I was probably obsessed with Carnage and Venom at the time. So, Are we going to sell that at OAX? Is that going to be uh, available? No, <laughs> there's no way my wife or my mom would let me sell this guy. <laughs> but we, um, I'm going to, I'm going to post that this week. We'll post it on my wife and I will post it on Instagram and, um, on Twitter for people to see. Cause it's like, I, I had completely forgotten about this, but I'm pretty stoked to see this and I'm, I'm really happy to share this. And I thought it was probably, I was going to have it ready for the interview. And unfortunately that's what I had to run out for a second. Moms are the best. They always hold on to, it. I think you said you might have another couple covers you wanted to show off there too. Did like, you have a couple, couple covers? Things, let me see. So 
Well, I guess thank you so much for filling out my spots. This is the other example we used for the, the full size commission, like the full 11 by 17 character. You know, with the full, you can see like the the ink wash and some of the rendering I'll do on that is kind of when I get into it. The, what is that? What is that, that Daredevil cover? I love that. Awesome stuff. You got to bring that um, Stormbreakers piece. I want to see it in person, Josh. If you remember, stick it in a folio so I can, can take which, a look at it. Which one was the Stormbreakers one? The one that was like almost all doodles. It was colored. It had all different characters on it. Oh, you know, yeah. Hey, remind me before the show. I'll just put it in and not for sale, but I, I want to. Yeah, it's like kind of the doodles, all the things. There's another one of the X-Men covers that is recent release that I haven't really put up publicly for sale. I think I brought it to new york but i didn't think i had it up for sale because they just had released it publicly that week or were about to so i think i'll bring this one as well to oax and it's got the high evolutionary and a uh, uh, whole bunch of weird animal things in the back there uh, i'm going to give everybody a little hint about going through josh's folio make sure you look behind the art that's up front because our friend aranga found a cover josh didn't even know he had at new york i believe and uh yeah. was able for a really nice one what was fun? I think he wanted to buy the one. He wanted to buy one, and I literally picked up that one through it. And behind it was a cover. He's like, "Actually, I'll take that one instead." <laughs> <So>. <laughs> All right. And, uh, this is uh, on the She Devil, Black, White, and Blood, uh, Marvel Zombies, which is coming up. I think it's like issue four ish or something like that. And that's all. There's, you know, colored in my own blood, of course. Type type O negative, and I got that. I'll have that with me for the show. Oh, the ones I was talking about earlier. So X Men. The X-Men issue that came out this week, I had a lot of people asking me, there's an appearance of some new mutants that I have and, and Dr. Doom and stuff. And a lot of people have been asking about buying the Doom pages. Unfortunately, that's over sale, but the, the early part of the issue has to do with, uh, has an appearance of Apocalypse and Sunfire. And I had not put those up for sale. And there's, there's collectors who had already contacted me about these pages, but I had not put them up for sale. But again, I think I'm going to hold off. And for OAX, I will have, I have this, this, uh, this spread of Apocalypse that was from- this Oh, wow with uh, Sunfire and it's kind of as far as story moment for those following along is a really, really cool moment. And probably besides Doom appearing at the end is probably the highlight of the issue. So um, y'all can see that at uh, OAX. And if you do, if you're a big uh, Apocalypse fan, I'll have it available for yeah. you. We have a lot of collectors that collect the, um, you know, the style guides or what have you may do for new characters. So if you have some of those for those new, I think they're Doom's X-Men, right? If I remember the, the story yeah. correct. Yeah, I, I, uh, I, I'm keeping all those ones are pretty kind of kind of big deal to me, I guess. And, and my wife and I have talked about it like that. I'm keeping those first appearances of them and the design sheets for them. So maybe someday you can uh, contact my kids after I die and you can buy them. But <laughs> Well, that makes total sense. But even just to show, right, Josh, you're going to bring up a, a, a not for sale folio. People love to look at your art. So, you know, you know, I, shy. it's a good idea. I, I, I should bring some of that uh, stuff because there are some key pieces that I have kept and, referring back to my wife, she's been good about kind of um, curating my stuff. For me, I'm like, I'll sell anything. I need to pay some bills. But she's been good about like, okay, no, these are things that we need to think about just not just for our future and for our children's future, just because they're good pieces that we really like and we want to keep, you know, around forever uh, that, uh, that maybe just kind of signify some of the moments that I've had, you know, in my career. That's all you should. I mean, some of the best stories you hear about artists that kept a lot of their own pieces till later so i'm glad to hear you're doing that but i'm also glad to hear that you like us buying your stuff too and let enough out there and our, our friend dan says tell josh to sell those sunfire pages complete please so complete, I don't uh, know if okay you know i mean maybe that will be there's there it's these those four pages uh it's not a bad idea to see if uh to sell them all complete because i actually i'm hemming and hawing I really love the first page as well, and I'm, I'm, and I might keep it, but maybe, maybe I'll just sell it as a block if I do let go of it. Makes sense. And Nick says Martha is the best, and I agree with that. Your wife is a sweetheart, and, I, and I'm glad to hear she's coming down to the show. Too. Yeah, she's she is much prettier and smells much nicer than I do. <laughs> I think that that keeps us all sane. Josh, thank you so much. I'm going to wrap it up here. Let you get back to real life. Bill, I guess I just clicked end stream. Thank you, everybody. Thank you for filling Josh's slot up, and thank you for listening to us talk for an hour. Get back to buying art out there, guys. Cheers, guys. Bye-bye. I'll see you in January.